I'm Lance Olson. I, am, I work in the program management team at Microsoft for what we call the Applied AI effort. And uh, I'm responsible for Azure Cognitive Services and Azure Cognitive Search. Broadly speaking, what is the mission statement of the Applied AI team? What we are focused on as a mission is really taking uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning in general, and then applying it to specific problems and building services that enable developers to bring that technology to their solutions. We focus on a range of problems that include things like uh, language understanding, so processing documents and uh, understanding documents, making sense of massive amounts of content, uh, speech, uh, speech recognition and speech transcription, computer vision, and then also helping uh, people to build applications that can make more effective decisions. When it comes to NLU, or natural language understanding, there's a variety of things available, and uh, it's actually been a really hot topic in the last, I'd say, 18 months or maybe mm -hmm. two years. Uh, what kind of solutions are you finding are most effective in the projects you're taking on? You know, we see a large demand for coverage across a, a broad set of languages, of human languages. Mm. So what's one of the big challenges is there's, there's a lot of good NLU tech for English and then and maybe Chinese, but then as you start to build solutions that include more countries or more locations with more languages, it quickly falls off. And so um, that is one, getting, getting broad language coverage across a set of languages that are relevant to uh, customers that work in any part of the world is, I think, a big challenge that we've invested a lot in that, that really helps. Um, and then there are applications of that. Um, one of those is uh, content understanding or a knowledge acquisition of content. So being able to process different types of data and uh, different types of language and then understand what that is. It could be something like a call center intelligence mm -hmm. uh, where calls are coming in and being transcribed and then you're, you've got real-time analysis uh, systems looking at that call and saying, you know, how is the sentiment trending of the call? Did the person ask for a supervisor or a manager? Do they seem frustrated? Do they seem happy? Mm -hmm. uh, and then being able to make kind of on-the-spot uh, decisions based on that. To the last point you made in articulating the AI team's mission that, you know, make smarter decisions, yeah. how do some of those tools fit in? Sentiment analysis in particular, while I think it's a technology that's gotten very advanced, uh, it's not without its flaws, as one might expect. You know, it, limited in sarcasm, although getting better there. But I don't know some people are just grumpy, and maybe you just woke up on the wrong side of the bed. You know, I wouldn't expect perfect accuracy from systems like that. Yeah. How do you um, take a imperfect tool and build it into an enterprise system in a way that uh, the organization is going to accept? Like you said, I think there are different uh, kind of advancements happening in, in sentiment. There's sentiment at the sentence level and at the word level, there's aspect level sentiment. So mm. the notion of the sleeping bag was really warm, but when it rained, the waterproofing didn't work. And so I got very wet. If you look at that sentence all up, that might be a neutral or a negative sentence. If you can do the next level of analysis and attribute, you know, wet to the waterproofing of the sleeping bag and the warmth as a good attribute to the sleeping bag, then you get a much better understanding of what somebody's actually saying. So advancements like that are things that I think help a lot. But then most of the applications that we see with sentiment in particular, there's a human in the loop who's also mm. making a decision. So they might be looking at the trend of a conversation over time or the trend of content over time or over multiple instances. And then they can see it may not be perfect on one specific or, or another specific case, but over time we tend to see positive and negatives kind of come out in the wash. So with that in mind, a developer or a machine learning expert, I guess the full range of people with background in ML can come to the table with a big project and pick up some of these components and put them together and build something bigger than the sum of the parts. What's a typical project like that? Where does it begin? How do people, where do they struggle and how does it get delivered? From the applied side, our focus really with things like cognitive services and cognitive search, in particular, no data science expertise required. So our goal is really to enable developers to be able to use machine learning in their applications. We released a service called the Personalizer. Actually, it went to general availability this week. And the Personalizer is a reinforcement learning-based personalization service that, let's say you have a website and you have 40 things you could present to a user on a page and you're trying to decide which ones and in what order. With the personalizer, what you would do is you would 
first call, the function is called a, the rank function. The rank function, you would pass all the options that you have and then all that you know about that individual that might be relevant to or you think could be relevant to what could determine what they want the most. And then the service would come back and tell you, here is what I think is the optimal ordering for these items. And this, these are the items you should display and this is the order. And then you typically have like a timeout period, so it could be 30 seconds or a minute or whatever makes the most sense for the experience you're building. Within that time, if the user clicked on the first one that you presented, you would call the reward method on the service and you'd give it a reward of one. If they didn't click on anything, you'd give it a reward of zero. Mm -hmm. And if they clicked on something in between, you might give it a reward of 0.5, and you determine the reward function, basically. Mm. And from the rewards it gets or doesn't get, it learns what attributes are most effective in determining what people want. When we first started building that service, we had a data scientist that we would deploy for each internal. We started doing this internally at Microsoft, and, and his name was Marco. We had to deploy Marco to go tweak the model basically for every customer. Sure. And so before we could would ship the product, we created a policy called the no Marco policy, which is <laughs> we will not ship this product if we have to deploy Marco with, to every customer. Um, we it doesn't to, scale well? It does not scale. He, Marco's <laughs> awesome. I love the guy, but he's... Uh, but he's just one person, so we can't send him everywhere. It hasn't been Dockerized no, yet. No, no. <laughs> that really is kind of one of the underlying design tenets for us. Mm -hmm. So then it really depends on the, the complexity of the project. If the project involves like adding personalization in this case or adding speech to text or adding um, computer vision to your application, it's usually pretty straightforward. You can get a prototype going in 30 minutes. Usually the application cycle looks more like a month to a few months from the time that we start having the conversation to the time that it ends up in production. If you're talking about a kind of a more complex end-to-end -end application that has custom models that they need to build that might require a data scientist, then the process gets more substantial. Mm -hmm. Could sure. be six months. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'm really fascinated by the fulfillment of the no Marco policy, which yeah. obviously you did to bring this to public availability. Yeah. I see that as a big challenge because yeah. different organizations have very different needs, different features that could impact, you know, the appropriate ranking. And of course, reinforcement learning at infinity at the asymptote, it'll figure it all out. Yeah. But uh, maybe I have some domain knowledge or something that'll help me tweak. What are the techniques or procedures that you uh, either did to automate that or to empower the developers to do what Marco was doing? One of the big questions our customers had when they were looking at using this, uh, like one example was the Xbox. So we, we worked with the Xbox team to add this to the decision of what tiles to show when the Xbox boots up. Mm. And they'd been doing personalization for years with data scientists and the Xbox team. Yet when we added this approach, we were able to get a 40% uplift in click-through rates on the Xbox homepage, on wow. the Xbox startup screen, which is a huge uh, gain for yeah, yeah. a product that's been in market for 10 years or more. One of the things we did, of course, was we picked a specific domain. So instead of the universe of what you could do with reinforcement learning, we said, we're going to apply this to personalization. Mm -hmm. And that allowed us to really remove a whole bunch of the knobs, basically, from the problem. Even then, the Xbox team would not just take a service from us and start deploying that into production for their home screens mm -hmm. without significant validation. Mm -hmm. So we built a capability that lets you feed in your past logs and have the service predict what it thinks somebody would have done and mm -hmm. then compare that to what they actually did based on the clicks. So when we did that with the Xbox team, now this isn't a perfect test because they're not getting the benefit of the placement that the personalizer would actually recommend sure, because sure. It's, it's historical. So it's based on whatever was on the page, but we're still picking what we think is the right answer. Based on that, they estimated they'd get about a 21% improvement in click-throughs. And so that was something that they were able to run and then gain confidence in the outcome. So they were able to train basically the service on their historical data until the ser service performs at the level or better of their current algorithms. Mm -hmm. We've also done this in a way that it can be combined with an existing personalization system. So you can say, well, I'm going to take my existing system and, and just keep that running. And maybe it comes up with let's say, 10 things that it thinks somebody wants, and then I can add the personalizer on top of that, and it might give me ordering or something mm -hmm. like that. And we've still seen kind of good 
low risk results kind of as a way to extend the system without uh, without having to rip and replace uh, parts. Yeah. You know, those are some of the key things we did. We also have uh, some of the lead researchers in the world on reinforcement learning. John Langford is one of the sure, yeah. people that we partner deeply with John and his team to basically develop the algorithms in such a way that we could uh, ensure a high confidence result in this particular use case. When you were describing the weighting as one of the options the developer could customize, yeah. very intuitive, right? If they click the first thing in a short period of time, that's a total win. Give it yeah. one or a hundred or whatever scale, we can normalize it all. Yeah. Not picking anything sounds like a zero. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, like you said, maybe you reward partially for clicking second or third or something. Yeah. But that's a big choice. And I could see where choices like that might have very emergent behavior that mm-hmm would be fun to play with, but uh, also hard to predict. Yeah. What do you see in practice that uh, people are able to do there? Are there strategies or best practices you know of for picking your weighting schemes? Yeah, so there, there are kind of two aspects to it that we see. There's reinforcement learning. There's a notion of explore versus exploit. Mm-hmm. Explore is educated guessing by the service to figure out what options m- matter to people based on the input variables that have come in. And then exploit is really optimize for what you think is the best answer Mm -hmm. rather than risk, you know, trying something that might not be the best answer. And so we give people the ability to dial that ratio. So they might do 98% provide the answer we know is the, or we believe is the right one and 2% explore, for example. Of course, when you do that, then you're not learning as effectively. Sure. But there's a balance there that really comes back to the risk that you're willing to take versus the reward of learning faster. You need to come up with some kind of a reward function. So time, if it's, if it's a, examples like personalization on a web page or on a product like we've just been talking about, it, it can be time. Maybe it's how far they scroll down on the page. Mm-hmm. Um, and based on that, I'm kind of calculating a percentage between one and zero, which then becomes a reward function. So that's more to measure engagement. I've seen other cases where people had mobile applications and they had users giving them feedback based on what the application was recommending. And there it could be, you know, imagine it's even something like a, a workout personalizer. Mm-hmm. So it's saying, what workout did, should I do today? And then it comes back and after they work out or maybe at the end of the day, they can say, did you, know, did you feel good or did you feel bad? Or what did you eat? And how did your eat and your, your food and your exercise impact the way you felt? And how did that tie back to the recommendations? And so then the application can be used to complete the feedback loop and give the reward, good or bad, to the service. Today, 43% of college grads work underpaying jobs that don't require a degree, while 200,000 tech jobs go unfilled in high-growth industries across the U.S., according to research by Burning Gas Technologies and Strata Education Network. Flatiron School can give you the skills to build a career you love. At Flatiron School, you'll learn data science from seasoned instructors and study a carefully structured curriculum designed to introduce you to the math, programming, algorithms, and data engineering skills to prepare you for a career as a professional data scientist. Your education will be paired with career support from our best-in-class career services. You'll meet weekly with a dedicated career coach on resume review, interview prep, and build an employer network to help you land the job you want. Complete details are available at flatironschool.com slash terms. Learn more at flatironschool.com slash data skeptic. In the Xbox use case, recommending the tiles, and you'd mentioned a 40% improvement in click-through rate, which is pretty astounding in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if this is a meaningful distinction, but I'm curious uh, if you have a sense of what it figured out. For example, I could see that sometimes it would find convenient things. Someone who's price sensitive wants a shortcut to know about their billing statement rather than the four clicks they would have had to use before versus like novelty where it's like, oh, I didn't even know about this, but I'm glad you presented it to me. Yeah. Um, There's so many ways in which those clicks can be generated. Were you guys able to garner any insight as to the wisdom that the system brought to the surface? I don't know what features ended up being the most impactful in the in the specific case of the Xbox, mm-hmm. but, but we did build in, uh, one of the key features we built in around model explainability in the service is actually a graph that is designed to answer that question. It basically looks at all of the features that you fed in and it tells you these are the ones that over time we've learned have the heaviest weighting in terms of predicting the outcome. That can be an iterative process where you as a developer then get this list and you go, okay, I thought this one would make a difference, but it turns out it didn't at all. And then there was this other one over here that, you know, maybe it was the weather outside when they were booting up their Xbox. And 
I didn't think that would make a difference, but it turns <laughs> out it makes a huge difference. And so then I'm going to look for maybe related metrics that I never thought of even feeding into the system. But since I've seen these ones have an impact, maybe these other ones will, so you can experiment that way. So we tend to see people iterating like that. On one side, I was thinking, gee, as an ML engineer, maybe I'd be threatened by this product because it's about to take away perhaps what my core delivery is. But on the other hand, perhaps it's empowering that I can spend more of my time working on those features, which mm-hmm. even though rank is sort of universal, I'm sure the algorithm can use that, uh, underscore cohort five is not directly contextually useful to the contextual bandits. So mm-hmm. I have to be the one to know that's an important feature and yeah. dish it in. Are you seeing workflows like that developing on other products as well? We are. And one of the things that we're looking at is actually integrating this personalizer functionality in with Azure Machine Learning. Mm. So if you as a data scientist want to do more and have more fine-grained control over the personalization process and over the reinforcement process, you can actually pull out aspects of the experiment, connect them into a data science environment, and then change them and then send them back into the service and affect the change. Our default bar is the no Marco rule, so we, don't, we <laughs> didn't want Marco to be required. Sure. But if you happen to have somebody who has the data science skills, we want to make it so that that person can participate as well. And that's something I think increasingly that we're investing in is ways to connect the services for developers with what data scientists can do. And often we'll see services like computer vision used as really effective ways to rough cut a problem. So estimating the cost of a windshield repair for a broken windshield and somebody's uploading a picture of the broken windshield, um, it's relatively straightforward to train a model using computer vision services that will tell you, oh, they uploaded a you know, picture of a bicycle or, and, or there's, no, um, there's no broken windshield on this car. Mm-hmm. It's a lot harder to create a monetary value estimate using those services. Sure, but yeah. there you could say, well, I'm going to get rid of all the noise by simply running the default computer vision services over my input and then I can stop if people had a bad input or if they or if what they if they picked the wrong image or something mm-hmm. and then I can do the further processing on the crack in the windshield. If I'm understanding correctly that would be like a two-stage system yeah. where mm-hmm. first we'd roll out cognitive services which yeah. are really powerful and great but also you know, generic, they, they don't know about estimating uh, auto repair costs yeah. any more than they do about specific types of cancer. But, right. you know, they can say, oh, that's an x-ray. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, that's sort of like a first filtering phase. And then I can trust that any image that's getting to phase two is um, appropriate or... Yeah. What, uh, is that sort of the workflow people are developing? Yeah, yeah. And that, and that enables you to dramatically simplify the variables you're dealing with as a data scientist. Mm-hmm. Because then you can say, oh, well, these images have all made it through this level of curation. So now the option space that I have to deal with for my own algorithms is uh, much more constrained. And so I can focus and do much more specific things. We talked a little bit in our uh, pre-discussion about mm-hmm. cognitive search. Yeah. I've covered cognitive services in general on the show. Cognitive search we haven't. Can you talk about what that is and how those things fit together? Cognitive search is really an evolution that we've seen out of what started as search. Initially, it was people wanting to search over documents so they would index the documents. What what we found, though, was that increasingly our customers wanted to be able to apply machine learning models to the content they had, whether that be text or it could be an image or it could be audio or video Mm -hmm. or whatever form factor that it's in. And then they want to be able to understand what it's actually talking about. So they want to get to the underlying topics that are in the content, independent of what type of data it is or where it lives. And so it started to create basically a semantic understanding of the data that they're working with, independent of the shape or the location of the data. That's what led us to building Cognitive Search. And Cognitive Search really it allows you to build sequences or pipelines of machine learning skills. Those could be cognitive services that are services that are domain-specific that are already trained and, and targeted at a specific use case, or it could be custom code that you've written mm-hmm. that just has heuristics, or it could be custom machine learning models that you create in Azure ML and do things like domain-specific classification, for example. And then you can sequence those and um, extract knowledge, extract information about all the data, and then reason over that knowledge. Do you have an example use case we might walk through of cognitive search in, in, out in the wild in the field? We see a lot of cognitive search usage for things like contract management. Let's say I'm a manufacturer and I have bids for projects and I'm trying to figure out what the requirements might be. And maybe I'm working with like a government, so the bids might be a 200-page document. Mm-hmm. 
and I want to figure out what the requirements are, or I'm in healthcare and I have researchers who are trying to find correlations between different types of medicine and different types of diseases, and so I will ingest large quantities of all of the historical documents that I have related to cases and medicines, and now I look for correlations. One that we actually are covering this week at the show was um, British Petroleum. They ingested 600,000 historical documents of all of the work that their geologists had done in the field and then ran it through knowledge mining pipelines that let them use a geographical exploration tool to highlight any part of the world that they've ever done any work in and basically surface up the core facets and entities that are discovered and the relationships between those entities in that part of the world so they can say, okay, this type of the world is rich in these kind of resources and we found that it relates to these kind of outcomes for our activities. What are you most excited to see people taking advantage of? Are there any services that are underutilized, in your opinion, that perhaps a good opportunity? Speech transcription. I mean, Uh it's getting heavy use, but I still consider to be underutilized in the sense that there's so much that um, is spoken and then has to be repeated because it's not effectively captured or in a form that is easy for people to process or understand. So Uh think about the number of times, you know, if you've ever had to call into a call center, the number of times you've had to repeat the problem that you're calling in about. And a big part of the reason that happens is because that call, that, that description that you made is treated as audio, and so the next person in line, is not it's very hard for them to listen to the whole conversation or all the conversations you've had with previous people yeah. on support. Transcribing that, though, they can, and then running things like entity extractors or summarizers over it, we can basically summarize the conversation you had so that then it makes it far easier for anyone else that you have to work with on that problem to quickly come up to speed on the conversation, on your description of even the the situation you have, and then take action on it. I'm old enough that I've seen that technology develop from a day when it didn't work at all to today mm-hmm. when it actually works very well. Yeah. Um, but not perfectly. Yeah. Um, things like, you know, bad cell phones, which are outside the algorithm. They goof up audio signal and they compress mm-hmm. it to the maximum degree. Mm-hmm. So this is still a hard problem. Yeah. What is the state of the art in the variety of deployments you're able to see? It is quite good, but it's absolutely not without its noise still. There are a few things that have really helped it. Certainly the application of neural nets to speech has made, we've seen huge gains in accuracy and also in synthesis, uh, in our ability to do things like speech to text. Uh, We just announced this week our neural text to speech service capability, which is amazing in terms of how realistic it can sound and how natural it can sound. On the text analytics side, we run entity recognizers that are deeply trained entity recognizers that we combine with speech. So we'll have speech text that runs over something. We do the same thing with OCR. So whether it's vision coming into text or audio coming into text, we can then run entity recognizers on top of that. And so if the conversion process from, let's say, audio to text had errors in it, the entity recognizers can basically account for those errors in the same way that human mind would, if you read a word that has an E in it, but it's actually spelled with a three, your mind will flip that and you'll read it correctly. Mm -hmm. So the entity recognizers can help there. The other thing that is starting to make a big impact is we're getting far more domain specific in the taxonomies that we look for. So we have ah. we have generalized speech models and, and language models. It's really hard because if you're trying to recognize a word like penicillin and the search space that you have to think about is the entire vocabulary of the English language. That's a far more difficult thing to do or, you know, Benadryl, any kind of medicine name. Sure. Then if you know that you're actually dealing with that domain. One of the things that we announced this week, actually, for speech is what we call tenant language models, which basically lets an Office 365 administrator go in and turn on a capability to take things that have been posted in your organization's public news groups or public email groups or SharePoint sites and apply that content actually to inform the language model. So the, it will learn basically the vocabulary of your organization. And so we can do that by domain, like by industry, and we can also do it by tenant. And so if there are projects that you talk about that are maybe code names for your projects or other kind of unusual terms, our services can learn your lingo. The biggest challenge that um, we worked hard to solve for that is um, privacy 
and kind of the data that gets exposed and, and what data gets factored into uh, sure. the language model. That's the public only channels. And that's why, yeah, we're really careful to give a lot of control to uh, that's not on by default. You have to go turn it on and then it's on the public data only inside of your organization. Makes sense. I definitely see the ethical concern there. Mm-hmm. What are you most excited about that some of the recent announcements are going to have an impact on in the near future? Yeah, so one of the services I'm uh, we're really seeing a lot of interest in and and is solving a, a common problem. And it's one of these, in a lot of cases right now, uh, like you were saying earlier, the state of the art is moving very quickly in this space and AI, as we all know. There are often these convergence points where things that just weren't possible because it, you know, you've seen it in the movies, we've all seen it in the movies for 20 years, but it's never been accurate enough that you could actually do it reliably until a set of things gets good enough and then all of a sudden it happens. One of those that we've seen in the last year is a service we call Form Recognizer, but it's related to document understanding. We work with customers who have lots of data that's locked up in forms. could be something that's actually like a a handwritten document, Mm -hmm. or more often, though, it could be a PDF or a scanned image, a typed image, or even like a SEC, like a financial filing or a financial document. This week, we announced an addition to the Form Recognizer service. So for a while, we've had the ability to train on forms in an unsupervised way. So you feed five forms into the service that are filled out, and we basically learn the underlying structure of the form based on those five examples. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you can feed new instances of the form that you've completed, and it will extract the values, the key value pairs from each of the fields in the form, and then give you a JSON document that has the key value pairs from from the form. The thing that we added this week was a feedback loop. So it's really a supervised learning layer that goes over the top of the unsupervised. Mm. And we've dealt with all kinds of crazy forms. And we have customers who literally have um, teams of analysts, data analysts, who really are there to analyze the data and make decisions. But they often spend a chunk of their time just inputting the data out of the forms. And Mm -hmm. some of these forms might have like a wax seal over the top of the document or a stamp or something like that. So you've got text in a form in a box with a stamp over the top of that and trying to OCR that can be really challenging. Yeah. So the feedback loop lets people go in and highlight any part of the form and then tell the service, this is exactly what this is. So it kind of helps get much higher accuracy on the results that you get back. And I know that sounds maybe like a mundane problem. It's a problem that is acute. Like people spend lots and lots of time when they would like to be focused on making sense of what's in the data right, right. and instead they're inputting the data. Yeah. When uh, people are giving feedback like that, about how many iterations should they expect before the system is able to pick up on the learnings? If they go in and give us feedback on about five different examples, we can begin to learn pretty quickly. It depends oh. on how complex the form is. Sure. But, you know, five yeah, yeah. to... Five to 15 examples is a pretty good start. Well, that's not asking too much. For anybody who's been inspired to try that out or any of the other systems we talked about today, where are the best places to get started? So if you go to azure.com slash AI, that's really the, the best place. It's the hub that we have on online for people to discover uh, all the services. And, and there's a lot of the services have, most of the services have free trials and they're also part of the Azure trial. So you can get thousands of free transactions a month. So it's, it's usually enough that you can go in and get a really good sense for uh, what they can do and how to use them. Well, Lance, where can people find you online? I would recommend people just look me up on LinkedIn. It's mm-hmm. Lance Olson, O-L-S-O-N. I'm the one that's at Microsoft. All right. And so I'm happy to talk and let me know how I can help. Awesome. Thanks so much for talking to me today. Yeah, you're welcome. 